Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Nicolas Roussel, and uh, I have the pleasure of uh, being here and recording this presentation to uh, report on the TC233DFC detailed fabrication with concrete that I had the honor to chair along with my colleague Dirk Lofk from Braunschweig University. So I'd like to start with uh, uh, this, uh, these pictures. Well, these are pictures that we know more or less, but the thing is that often we, we don't consider much the way these things were, were produced, were, were shaped. So what we can say is that wood carving or wood processing in general is mostly a subtractive process. It means that you take a piece of wood and you're going to extract some material until you reach the desired shape. And timber structures, so something that you can build with some wood elements, are often produced from a fastening assembly process. So this is a non-permanent assembly process for these uh, structural elements. On the other end, masonry, so one of the other fields of Rylem, is an assembly process through some adhesive bonding, the joints, of elements resulting from a subtractive process, the stones you obtain through extracting material from a piece of stone. Well, if we apply the same description, very specific to the processing field and the processing community to concrete, well, what we realize is that we have been taking for granted that concrete shaping is a formative process. So it means that we have a liquid material. We're going to fill the mold using mostly the help of gravity-induced stresses, so the weight of the material itself. And because concrete can set, and because of this solidification feature, we're going to obtain a shape that is permanent uh, after we have retrieved the mold. Well, this thing could be about to change. Well, let's change totally uh, the, the focus and let's move to the 80s in Japan. So what happened there, while the industry was still mostly a subtractive or a formative process, so it means that in most industries, people were getting objects, shaping objects by extracting material from an initial piece of material or uh, molding material in some uh, specific shapes that, uh, that, that were controlled through the mold, like in the plastic industry. Well, in the 80s in Japan, people started to uh, explore the field of uh, something else, additive manufacturing. Of course, main masonry could be seen as well as additive manufacturing. You add layer by layers material. But here, for the first time, this term was used, and people were able to print 3D print, because these were 3D elements compared to the typical 2D printing that we have uh, with our ink printers, some, uh, some shapes. And it didn't take long, about 15 years, uh, for the pioneers in the civil engineering thing, before someone thought about using that for concrete and structure printing, and mostly house printing, or as well, robot printing on the moon uh, for us before we arrive there, or robot printing for the army before the soldiers come there so that the soldiers are protected when they arrive. A lot of application in niche uh, cases or niche applications or more generic such as residential buildings. But the pioneers of Borough University in the UK and Southern California US University in the USA uh, started rather slow, but suddenly the media coverage became really high. And uh, in, the, in the meantime, some teams all around the world started to explore this technology, either in the industry or in academia. So here I'm showing pictures from TU Munich, from DTI in Denmark, and from my friends and colleagues uh, from uh, TU Eindhoven in the Netherlands, uh, who are using this type of technology, so extrusion-based additive manufacturing. I'll come back on this specific name and the, the why this name is chosen later. And you can see here that by depositing through an extrusion process, some layers of material one after the other, you're able to do a 3D printing or 2D.5, as you see that you are printing mostly vertically and uh, shape some elements. Well, in this case, the process is rather simple to describe. You print one layer, you wait until this layer is strong enough to uh, carry the weight of a second layer and layer by layer, you are able to uh, build a shape. Another technique that has been developed already some long time ago and technique that is used in the steel industry, but not with a, a binder, but by 
uh, melding, melding, molding, uh, melting the steel locally uh, is the, the powder bed injection technique. The pioneer in this case is Enrico Dini, and the process is called D-shape. And we can see here a bridge in Spain that was, uh, that was built this way. And it's a very interesting process because, uh, well, you have a layer of powder or a layer of aggregates, and you inject inside a binder. So it can be water that does react with the cement inside the powder layer, or it can be a cement grout that uh, binds the sand grains in the powder layer. Well, and layer after layer, you only have a reaction inside the zone where you inject the binder. And what you do is that progressively, you print, 3D print, inside your bulk powder, the part that you need, and at the end, you just retrieve the powder that was not reacted, that was not binded, bounded by the injection of the binder. So here I'm showing you some um, example uh, in, uh, in Munich as well of this technology. So here, uh, this is an injection of, of a water in a powder bed containing cement. And uh, well, that's a good illustration of the resolution. And what you can see in this other case where in fact here a, a grout is injected in, inside a sand bed is that after the process is over, is over, you can get rid of the unreacted sand and retrieve an element that we can see here virtually drawn because officially, I mean, normally we don't see it inside the, inside the bed. And you can extract an element that is fully uh, 3D, in this case, not 2D.5, but really 3D. And you can produce some extremely complex shape without a mold. Well, some other technologies do exist. The one developed uh, by my friends and, coll and colleagues at ETH Zurich, the SDC, Smart Dynamic Casting, where you have a, 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 a formwork, very small one, that is just used to locally shape the material and deform it uh, while the material is setting. It allows you to have some very interesting shape and it is one of the only process when you can have some steel reinforcement uh, in, the, in the deposition process. Another technology developed uh, once again at ETH, the mesh mold, where here the digital fabrication is not on the cement base, but it is on the formwork itself. So you're going to 3D print a formwork inside which you're going to cast a cement based material. So here the mesh mold, the, uh, the material, uh, the, the, the steel bars that are, that are 3D printed are both containing the material that you will cast inside. And at the same time, they serve as reinforcement for the structural wall. And you can see that this robot is, uh, well, joining, assembling uh, all these metal pieces. So I'm showing this because I think it's, it's quite spectacular. It's, it's rather interesting. Uh, of course, it is a bit out of the scope of the technical committee. Uh, it was a bit out of the scope of the technical committee as it is not cement based, but it is used in the digital production of cement based elements. So it means that the technical committee had to take into account the existence of such processes as well uh, in the definition of the scope and, and in the obtention of the outputs of the TC. So what was uh, concluded uh, back then uh, uh, when, we, when we thought about this topic, when we discovered it, a few of my colleagues and myself, uh, is that there was a very wide range of various digital processes. And we were facing scattered and isolated research group from academia and industry. And even if they were all experts in their own digital processes, they of course had only a partial view and were not fully aware that other people were facing the same issues or sometimes facing some, some other issues than the ones we were facing. There were some demonstrators all around the world, a very high media coverage, but nothing close to the market, nothing close to a commercial market for concrete theory printing. On the other hand, Rylam is not a commercial association. Rylam is not even a standardization association. But what Rylam can do is, uh, well, to provide some very solid scientific background for a given topic, uh, to create a very strong scientific community and to properly define the semantic and the research needs and potentially create some uh, benchmark, some round robin test, also inter-laboratory comparison when uh, some testing is required and needs to be validated before going to the standardization. So what we decided in uh, 
2016 is to create a technical committee around these technologies as a whole, not only one, not only two, but all these technologies, so digital production with cement base, not to exclude anyone. And we had a first meeting in Washington DC in March and around 20 researchers from all around the world attended the meeting. It was a very interesting meeting, very messy because we had so many questions and we had so many different approaches that very quickly we came up with the uh, uh, knowing that we needed a classification. We needed a process classification. Some people had the feeling that they were doing the same thing when they were not, and some other people were thinking that they were not doing at all the same thing when in fact they were doing the same technology from a processing point of view. So of course, it's only the chapter two of the state of the art table in the table of content, but in fact, it is one of the things that took the longest time in the technical committee. It took almost four years to be able to find a way to put together a classification system in which we could have all existing technologies and in which we could include as well the people who are digitally producing, for example, some steel bar reinforcements, such as much more technology, and as well being able to deal with technology that are not existing yet. So saying very generic and very open. And at the same time, being able to locate in such a classification all the standard processes that we are using and mostly the formative process or so the typical casting of concrete. So we came up with this classification. It is of course uh, in the state of the art. It was published as well as a separate paper. And in this classification, we managed to divide uh, the different processes into primary process class, uh, process subclass, and potentially uh, secondary process if the process is composed of several sub-processes. The gray zone is the one that, is, that was of interest for the technical committee because it's the one dealing mostly with cement-based material and with digital fabrication. And if we look at this, we can find here the typical concrete supercasting. It's a shaping process, it's formative because it's using a mold, and it's possible because of a solidification coming from the material and its ability to set. At the same time, for complex processes with several steps, in this classification, it is necessary to cycle each step through the classification. It's not possible to find an answer and a name for your technology with only one step in most cases. So I'm giving you here two examples. I look at a typical precast residential building. So everything is built in a factory, brought to the site, assembled, and then joined or bounded. Uh, and this is an in situ uh, assembly of concrete elements obtained through solidification after a formative process. So that's a bit long, and we just say pre gassed and assembled on site. But if we look at the recently uh, produced 3D printed bicycle bridge in the Netherlands, uh, then in this case, using this classification with two cycles, it would be an off-site assembly of concrete elements obtained through extrusion-based additive manufacturing. And the principle behind the assembly process is some post-stressing of the printed elements. Well, after that, what we did, and we did all along the TC, was to list the research needs. Because even if people were using very different technologies, sometimes, in fact, they were facing the same difficulties. So what we wanted to list and to, 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 to gather were the research needs, which means listing on the underlying physics and sometimes mechanical or chemical problems that we will have to solve, that we are trying to solve as well at the same time uh, to improve our understanding and, and, and our printing and processes. So as I pre will present uh, tomorrow in, in, my, in my lecture, of course, it's a gravity consistency competition, so gravity yield stress competition. It involves a length scale that is often changing through the process, which is something that is not, that is not common uh, in most casting processes. Gravity is your enemy because without formwork, if your material doesn't get enough strength in quickly enough, then you will have a plastic collapse or you will have an instability of the printed element. At the same time, there are some very complex local features, some local cracking, but not due to, of course, to setting. We're speaking here about cracking in the fresh state during casting. Some local elastic instabilities at the level of the printing head, which can form these uh, Vienetta structures. So I thank here my colleagues from TU Eindhoven for this very nice picture. And 
we have as well some issues because if you print layer by layer, layer uh, you, you can uh, have some, some problems with uh, the layer interfaces and so mechanical uh, weaknesses locally and potentially some uh, faster progression or faster ingress of aggressive agents or aggressive ions in these zones. At the same time, the material being printed could uh, threaten the stability of the uh, element. So here I'll show a picture. Uh, this is a, a buckling instability. So the entire element falls on the side. And this is a plastic collapse. The first layer is not strong enough to carry the weight of element during the printing process. So these pictures were taken at, at TU Eindhoven once again. And uh, as well, without formwork, you have nothing to protect material from a very early age desiccation. I'm speaking here about desiccation before the initiation of setting. So we are facing a paste, uh, rather a firm paste, very consistent, but it is exposed to drying and it is often very small compared to the, 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 the this, uh, desiccation rate. And depending on the rheology of the material, well, you can have very different micro cracking patterns. For low yield stress materials, so very fluid initially, but that do structurate really fast and often heat a lot, release a lot of heat, even before the acceleration and the full setting of the material, we see some rather large localized cracks where we have some formation of micro cracks, almost like voids, a bit everywhere in softer materials with low structuration. Then what we, what we did as well, uh, then it was really um, well identified by the, uh, the, the work on the research needs, is that we did a full chapter and a full state of the art on fresh property measurements and control because we're not measuring at all the same pro fresh properties as usual. First, we need to measure materials that are often extremely stiffer than the usual uh, cement-based materials that we are using. And second, the materials are phase changing or are structurating extremely fast. Well, of course, the physical and chemical origin of this was, uh, was not the topic of the TC, but what is reminded in the, in the, in the state of the art. We didn't focus much on this. There is a some existing knowledge, but these chemical reaction or the admixtures that are used are usually for, for concrete are totally different here and, and require uh, some, some further research in the in a very close future. But more than anything, we are not able to measure the relogy requirements that we are able to compute. So we know more or less how the material should behave for the process to be fine. But it's extremely difficult without some very expensive equipment to measure today the rheology of the material to certify to quality for, for quality control purposes, to certify that the material is printable for a given printing process or for a given uh, elements to be printed. So this is one of the, of the big things that we concluded. There is an obvious lack of measuring protocols and quality control tools for these printable materials. And finally, more as an exploratory basis, because the amount of available work in literature is very small. Uh, chapter five and chapter six dealt with uh, the properties and testing of printed cement based in the in hardened state. So how do you measure mechanical strength of such material? It's printed uh, layer by layer, for instance, in some technologies. So it's like a very strange composite with some anisotropic properties. And, and similarly, how do you uh, compute uh, and design uh, structurally these elements when they are reinforced in very different ways than usual uh, steel and concrete uh, elements? So these two chapters were mostly gathering the existing literature, but there were not that many things. And they were also as well uh, listing very much uh, the research needs for these two, uh, for these two aspects that are, that are very important for the process and its commer commercialization. So what, what resulted from these three last chapters, chapter four, chapter five, and chapter six, is in fact creation at the end of this technical committee of two new Ryland technical committee. One of them uh, called assessment of additively, additively manufactured concrete materials and structures. So mostly focusing on the, the, the quality control of printed elements. And another one uh, on performance requirements and testing of fresh printable cement-based materials. So the idea is to develop some tests do some benchmark comparison, round robin tests in tele laboratory, uh, so that we can provide some recommendation on how to test these printed materials and this printable material in the fresh state. And finally, for structures, uh, very naturally, uh, the work moved to FIB, uh, where a task group was created, chaired by uh, 
uh, small Italian colleagues and friends. Uh, and, and then this aspect will be, of course, done in collaboration because uh, Domenico Espone is as well a Rylan member and very active in the technical committee. So two conferences were happened and, and, and they were very attended. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of interest from industry. And, uh, and, and a lot of young people, extremely active, very good discussion, despite the fact that the second one was online. And finally, to conclude, I think that this TC defined the, the semantic of the domain. So of course, it's a very important first step, not very spectacular sometimes, but totally required to move on. I think one big step, one major output is this Rylan classification of shaping processes. At least we know how to describe what we are working on. I mean, for the introduction of paper, for patent, or, or for a standard, I think it's very important to know exactly for which type of process this, uh, the technology that is described it can be applied. Well, we created, uh, and with very much pleasure, uh, when we have made may, very many new friends, and, and a very dynamic and still growing community around this topic is appearing in Rhine. We have around 140 TC members in the two new TCs that I spoke about, with a very strong implication of the industry. About one third of the technical committee is from industry. And I think that the next step now for Rylan TCs is to contribute to some quality control and pre-standardization. So the idea is not to make uh, the final choice of the best test to, to quality control these, uh, these type of objects or these type of fresh materials, but the idea is to make a proposal of several tests and compare them and provide our opinion and provide some, some database about the use of these new tests. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention.